Welcome to the University of Johannesburg Public Lecture on CIRS, Africa's AI Initiative. I am Greg Barrett, the Chief Executive Officer of CIRS. This lecture will provide an unprecedented look at what is the largest and most complex undertaking of its kind in Africa's history. The lecture is intended for a general audience and I've endeavoured to ensure that there is something in it for everyone. So let's get started. In collaboration with academia, CIRS is a private sector-led initiative bringing together academia and industry for the establishment of world-class AI research and application capability for Africa. Although launched in 2019, work on CIRS started several years earlier, which included working with WITS University to host the CIRS infrastructure. CIRS was conceived almost a decade ago, but work on the first formal proposal started in 2017. At the time, my brother, Dr. Dean Barrett, who works at the Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory, LNLS, was seeking a way to apply machine learning to the vast amount of data they were producing. Working with his fellow collaborator at its university, Dr. Roy Forbes, it soon became apparent that BITS had similar needs and should be incorporated into the requirement. This was detailed in a proposal document and in early 2018 presented to BITS. Following meetings with stakeholders from across the university, Professor Dean Brady, head of the School of Chemistry and the director of the American Science Institute, with the support of Professor Zebron Balakazi, took the lead in pushing CIRS forward within BITS with the intention that this should benefit not only BITS University, but all academic and research institutions in Africa. Before I get into some of the CIRS specific details, I'm going to take a step back and confirm why so much time and money has been spent on this effort and answer why what we're doing is so important. Firstly, machine learning is at the core of a technological and societal artificial intelligence revolution that is impacting numerous areas of society, including scientific research. Secondly, Africa is absent from this revolution and has not made investments and undertaken initiatives that can compare with those in North America, UK, Europe, and more recently in Asia. Thirdly, academic institutions are struggling as a significant part of their basic research is now being done in industry with rapid commercialization results. And there is now little distinction between academic research and industrial labs. For those concerned with scientific research, the report referenced on the right of screen by Rick Stevens and Valerie Taylor from Argonne National Lab is a must read. If you've not already read it, I encourage you to do so. As an example of how materials research has been transformed, the days of researchers dressed in white coats synthesizing materials is rapidly coming to an end. Modern day efforts now deploy fully automated processes for synthesis, characterization and design. While automated and heavily reliant on current AI techniques, this is still a human in the loop science. Intelligent augmentation, as referred to by Michael Jordan from Berkeley, is perhaps the most appropriate description of the current state of affairs in AI. Another example worth noting. In the United States, the White House has recently announced plans to invest a billion dollars to advance AI across several industries. The effort spans a number of universities and fields. On the African side, things, however, are a little different. Specifically, there is no AI ecosystem to support our research and its application across various scientific fields. I have decomposed the AI ecosystem into five key components. The engineering pipeline, which includes hardware, software, machine learning and data engineers. Computing infrastructure, data infrastructure and industrial research and corporate venture capital operations. Importantly, these components are not present in Africa. And I will touch on some of these challenges in the next few slides. The absence of these components makes our research and its application across various scientific fields for the benefit of academia and industry in the region a non-starter. On the engineering side, there is significant technical debt underpinning machine learning techniques and systems that constitute what is commonly referred to as AI. The technical debt is comprised not only of engineering expertise, but also data, hardware and software. This technical debt is a substantial roadblock to various scientific researchers wishing to apply AI to their work. On screen, I have included an example from a 2019 paper that details some of the common faults found 
and specifically deep learning systems. The takeaway here is that the problems you will run into are numerous and extensive, and in many instances require non-trivial expertise to identify and address. This hinders researchers wishing to apply AI to their work, who are not experts in this field. Looking at some of the major AI systems over the years, in the context of the compute required, if we can compare LXNet to AlphaGo Zero, the price of progress was a 300,000x increase in the compute used. This is a doubling period every three and a half months. For comparison, Moore's Law had an 18-month doubling period. And it is not just being able to leverage computing that is necessary, but knowing how to use it optimally. The graph on the left of screen shows this shows the 62,000x performance improvement for matrix multiplication when using SIMD compared to native Python. Note that the y-axis is logarithmic, SIMD standing for single instruction multiple data. Such techniques are known and practiced by seasoned engineers, but are not common across industry and academia that are looking to leverage AI in their work. The takeaway here is that without the necessary computing infrastructure and the re requisite expertise to leverage it, the results are slow execution and ultimately slow science. To underscore the extent of the impact, on screen is a 2020 paper that details almost a 2 billion times acceleration of scientific simulation by using a technique called deep neural architecture search. Researchers in Africa cannot afford a delta of 2 billion X when undertaking their scientific simulations. These AI models and the use of infrastructure come at a pretty penny. For example, Google's MENA chatbot, released earlier this year, costs $1.5 million to train. But that is nothing compared to OpenAI's GPT-3, which cost almost $12 million to train. But don't worry, we can just use the cloud, some say. There are some not so small problems with that though. For a start, there is no high performance computing research cloud for AI in Africa. Not even the United States has an HPC research cloud for AR, although there are efforts underway to build one. It should be noted that those plans include a budget of $7 billion a year. Further, building such a cloud entails confronting the same challenges that we are addressing in building Cirrus, with the addition of a few more challenges. Most importantly, the existence of an HPC research cloud does not address the problem of providing user support. An HPC cloud for research is great for those researchers experiencing using such technology. Certainly most researchers do not have such experience. There is also a general lack of cloud-related research work in Africa. Such research includes developing new cloud-related operating systems, virtualization methods, performance variability studies, power management research, software-defined networking, artificial intelligence, and resource management. Test beds such as Chameleon Cloud offer the large-scale, deeply reconfigurable experimental platforms to support this research and run into the tens of millions of dollars to establish and maintain. As you can see, there are no users from Africa, and this is not because African users have their own testbed. In terms of AI-focused hardware, what is it and what does it look like? I have listed some of the major and emerging players. They include NVIDIA, Grok, Cerebrus, Preferred Networks, GraphCore, Sambanova, Habana, which is now part of Intel, and Lightmatter. The YouTube links are to overviews from the respective providers from the ISC HPC conference earlier this year, while there is also a link to the Lightmatter presentation from Hotchips32. The evaluation of AI-focused hardware performance does not follow traditional TOPS per watt, TOPS standing for Terra Operations per Second per Watt and has resulted in new evaluation benchmarks, some of which are well covered in this article. Moving on to matters on the data front, to advance research in Africa, there is a need for a data commons. In the simplest of terms, a data commons is a place where data lives. Over the years, I've seen countless presentations and articles on how data is the new black gold of the modern economy. Black gold being a reference to crude oil. Whether or not this is true is another matter, but just like crude oil needs a, to reside in a storage facility prior to downstream processing, so too does data. 
This could be the result of clinical trials, hourly readings of ocean temperature, tracking data from migratory birds, satellite imagery, data from X-ray defectometer, or any other scientific instrument. While at the lowest level, the infrastructure of a data commons is constituted of hardware and software, at a higher level, it also drives the implementation of a systematic data strategy that, amongst other things, ensures that investments in data, in data generating infrastructure, like scientific research infrastructure and instrumentation, is fully realized. Many of the universities attending this lecture today have scientific instrumentation running into high tens of millions of dollars. Yet the data generated by such infrastructure is going into a black hole. The black hole being researcher hard drives, flash drives, as well as personal institutional cloud storage folders. Ten years from now, most of this data will have disappeared. Clearly, this situation is unacceptable for modern day scientific research and there are many efforts around the world to address this problem. A good example of which is ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons. ARDC connects research infrastructure from universities and research institutions from across Australia and New Zealand to a data commons that supports multiple scientific domains. Examples include the characterization, bio and eco commons with further details on these listed at the link. Another example is the Cancer Research Data Commons, which is part of the National Cancer Institute in the US. Clearly having data strewn across various institutions and regions does nothing to solve the problem and only creates more data silos unless there is connectivity between them that supports collaboration and data sharing. Ensuring connectivity between these platforms is possible and is something that Cirrus is presently working on, including as part of the NIH program called DSI Africa. Ideally, what we are working towards is a system that supports the machine learning and data ecosystem. At present, such a system only exists at but a handful of the world's largest technology companies. The MLDP system depicted comes from a 2019 paper from a team at Apple. Another challenge in Africa that needs to be dealt with is connectivity. Think about our black gold analogy. The oil field our data generators need to be connected to the storage facility, our data management platform from Data Commons. Our storage facility then needs to be connected to the processing facility, our performance computing platform. At present, the connectivity in Africa is abysmal. If Africa is going to participate in the coming exascale scientific work, then plans need to be formulated and implemented to support such. These plans should at a minimum support a one terabit regional supercore and 100 gigabit edge nodes. So for example, VITS, UJ and UCT would connect to each other on the supercore, while VITS would connect to the LNLS, for example, through the edge node. That this is a matter of importance is one of the major reasons why Cirrus is working to host an edge node as part of Fabric, right of screen. Fabric is a test bed for the development of the next generation internet architecture. This will permit researchers from Africa to participate in the development of next generation internet technologies. Middle of screen is a new Facebook project, which will see the installation of a subsea cable capable of supporting more traffic than all existing cables combined. Moving on to industry and corporate research and corporate venture capital operations, in Africa these operations are near non-existent. I pulled the examples of two firms that attendees might be familiar with and that are operational on the continent, Chiota and Microsoft. Chiota's research operation, Chiota Research Institute, TRI, and its AI corporate venture capital operation, Chiota AI Ventures, have no operations on the continent. Microsoft's research operation, Microsoft Research, and its AI corporate venture capital operation, M12, are also missing in action in Africa. I'm not trying to single out these two firms. They are simply two examples. If you have to go through a list of the world's leading multinationals, taking your pick from the NASDAQ, Dow, S&P, FTSE, Zetradax, etc., you'll find that this is true in more than 90% of the instances. And it's not as if Africa can continue to be absent from this landscape. These firms are major players in research and commercialization ecosystem. I've pulled up an example from TRI on its material science work. TRI is a leader in material science research 
and has recently announced efforts to establish another corporate venture capital operation, Woven Capital, with $800 million in investment. The structure and domicile of these operations warrants consideration and further discussion. This is an example of a structure developed by the US Department of Energy to support hard tech funding and commercialization. This particular structure is called a first look funding structure. Now the reason I pulled this up is not to delve into the particular details, but to point out that these structures are meaningful and serve a specific purpose. It would not be possible for a university in South Africa, for example, to simply set up a wholly owned institute or private company and expect such to suffice for effective research and commercialization purposes. I'll be revisiting this in a serious context a little later. One example supporting successful industry and academic collaboration on research and commercialization is Semiconductor Research Corporation. Over at least three decades of operation, SRC has undertaken over 3,700 projects, provided over $2 billion in funding, and generated over 700 patents. Importantly, SRC has, amongst other things, a very clear intellectual property strategy that supports industry participation. If our list of challenges was not long enough, you can add intellectual property to it. And it's an important one. The Intellectual Property Rights Act, IPR Act in South Africa, determines that any invention resulting from research contracted by an outside party with a University Research Council will belong to the University Research Council unless the outside party pays for such research based on a full cost model. While this sounds inviting and easy, a full cost model is very difficult to determine and auditors can and do argue the details for years. So this approach is fraught with pitfalls and is one of the major reasons for several of the region's largest corporations having taken all their previously local research offshore. Some possible considerations for dealing with this problem include 1. Avoidance, which entails avoiding University Research Council altogether. 2. Forbearance. Under this approach, there would be joint ownership with University Commercial Forbearance. In such an instance, IP solely invented or authored by startup employees would be jointly owned by the startup and the university. However, the university agrees to forbear from commercially licensing the IP and can only use the IP for research, education, and non-for-profit purposes. This approach is used by the University of California at Berkeley in their shared special user facility agreement. The third and final approach would be to box it. This would entail executing some sort of standardized and clearly defined and predetermined full cost model, thus reducing ex post pitfalls like audits. Now that I've laid the groundwork of what we're dealing with, let's jump into the details around Cirrus and how these and other matters are dealt with. Cirrus has three major components. Cirrus itself houses the cooperation programs, the state-of-the-art competing infrastructure, and the open learning programs. The second component, the Cirrus Foundry, is equipped with everything needed to bridge what is called the Valley of Death, and that is overcoming the challenge of turning a startup idea or scientific research into large-scale commercial application. The business of the Cirrus Foundry is building other businesses. The Cirrus Foundry is characterized by ideation generally carried out by in-house team, the use of in-house staff and product creation, building multiple products centered around AI with the objective of being standalone businesses, retaining some ownership stake, and has a capital fund. For these reasons, it is not an incubator or accelerator and referred to as a foundry. The third component, the Cirrus Foundry Fund, is the in-house fund to support startups in the Cirrus Foundry to ensure they're not wholly dependent on outside capital. This fund has a target capitalization of $35 million and will undertake pre-seed and seed stage investments. For most investments, capital will be allocated at the pre-seed stage with investments of up to 3.7 million rand. The Foundry Fund will also follow a lead investor in seed rounds with investments of up to 7.5 million rand. This is a graphical depiction of the distinction between what is within the Cirrus domain and that which is within the Cirrus Foundry domain. In the simplest of terms, Cirrus is focused on the research stage the R in the R&D. The Cirrus Foundry is focused on the D in 
in R&D. Any development, deployment, and possible dollars are the concern of the Cirrus Foundry. The Cirrus Foundry occupies a strategic position. Firstly, on the research front, the Cirrus Foundry will concern itself with knowing what facilities and programs exist and where and how to leverage them. Secondly, on the innovation front, the Cirrus Foundry will be in a position of knowing what innovations lie in the pipeline and what industries are most likely to be impacted. Thirdly, on the industrial front, the Cirrus Foundry will be in a position of knowing what industry is looking for and importantly, what will constitute technical validation thus creating successful technology pathways. Concerning the roles of BITS University and Cirrus, BITS University is slated to be the host university for Cirrus. This means that the Cirrus infrastructure will be housed at BITS University and BITS University will lead the formation of the Cirrus Consortium. On the BITS side, Zebron Bilikazi is the project owner and Barry Dwalatsky is the project lead. Some of the members of the Cirrus team that have been working behind the scenes over the last several years include Alvika Louis Nell, who leads General Counsel, Johan Brink, who leads Corporate Investment Banking, Eric Talman, who leads Procurement, Supply Chain and Operations, Andre van der Merwe, who, leads, who leads Intellectual Property, and Jacques Ludic, who leads efforts on Cirrus Foundry Cape, the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa, and is a member of the Cirrus Advisory Council. Establishing Cirrus has been a multi-year process. That something like this has never been done before on the African continent has made the process even more challenging. The first step in the process was to lay the foundation which included agreements between Cirrus and the host institution, including the collaboration and land agreement. In addition, the host institution is also party on the Cirrus Advisory Council and the Cirrus Consortium. The second major step in the process is building the use case and takes us to where we are today. The use case is a justification for the necessary investment. You will note strong parallels between this and the call to action on the United States Research Cloud. The third and final stage in the process is the industry engagement where the funding is secured. This effort will be led by a global investment bank. The Cirrus budget is $200 million and the amount needs to be placed into context. While this might sound like a lot for Africa, and it is, it is small in comparison to efforts in North America, the UK, Europe and Asia. Less than this and Cirrus is simply not feasible. More than this and we start to exceed the capacity of what is needed and possible in Africa. Cirrus is structured to support public and private sector engagement. Private sector organisations supporting Cirrus are referred to as strategic founding partners. All strategic founding partners will receive equity in Cirrus, a seat on the advisory council and permanent admission to the Cirrus partner program. Academic and research institutions access Cirrus infrastructure and resources through the Cirrus consortium. In terms of the role of government, the Cirrus approach is for government to support its local academic and research institutions. This approach ensures that Cirrus does not take away from or compete for the scarce resources needed by academic and research institutions. Further, and very importantly, this approach ensures that there is no bureaucratic, political and poor governance spillover into service. This engagement map can be divided into three components. The funding which comes from the private sector, the users and major beneficiaries from the academic and research institutions, which provide the use case, and the private sector programs which include technology transfer strategies to support research and commercialization. I'll briefly delve a little deeper into each one, starting with the use case. The use case answers the question of who's going to use Cirrus, what they will use it for, and how this will transform the continent. It is primarily for the users of Cirrus to answer this question, that is the academic and research institutions. There are some ancillary challenges that need to enter into the discussion here. Specifically, the need to address one, intra and inter Africa connectivity, a data management platform come data commons to support science across the continent. At present, there is a lack of concrete plans for academic research institutions on the continent tackling these two challenges. While the implementation of a data management platform, the establishment of data commons and improving connectivity are not the primary objectives of Cirrus, we are well positioned to tackle these important issues and have several ideas in the pipeline. 
For example, Cirrus is working with various stakeholders on exploring the NIH program, DSI Africa, and specifically the requirement from an open, for an open data science platform under this program as an option to kickstart the data management platform for the continent. Turning attention to the Cirrus Consortium. As the host university, WITS University is leading the engagement with academic and research institutions wishing to join the consortium. This table provides a summary of what consortium members will have access to. It covers Cirrus, the Cirrus Foundry, and the Cirrus Foundry Fund. An overview of each of the items listed in the table is available in the consortium documentation. Importantly, there are no consortium membership dues, so participation in the consortium is free. Thus, no academic and research institutions are excluded because of financial constraints, and the extent of the benefits they accrue depends only on the extent to which they participate. This is a schematic view of the consortium structure. To simplify the consortium documentation, the documents including the bylaws charter, membership benefits, and the consortium membership agreement are each a separate document. Consortium members need only process the consortium membership agreement, which is a four-page document. The consortium membership agreement supports two classes of memberships, Tier 1 and Tier 2. Tier 1 is differentiated from Tier 2 by a high level of engagement through the appointment of an ambassador. The ambassadors serve as community builders, making connections between people and resources, and will be senior strategic individuals within their local institution and will typically be supported by a project manager. Collectively, the ambassadors form part of the Ambassador Advisory Network, which provides input and direction to the Cirrus Consortium governing body, the Cirrus Advisory Council. You will recall that I spoke about the LNLS at the beginning of the lecture, when I covered the origins of Cirrus. The LNLS is Brazil's new fourth generation synchrotron and is Brazil's largest and most complex technology project. It also provides a stellar use case for Cirrus. If you look at the world's most powerful computing platforms, most are used alongside such operations. For example, the world's most powerful computing platform, Fugaku, is installed at the Riken Center for Computational Science in Kobe, Japan, and supports, amongst other things, the Riken Spring 8 synchrotron facility. Delving into the funding behind Cirrus, The current list of prospective strategic founding partners, SFPs, stands at 154 firms. This does not include foundations and philanthropies. It is worth noting that none of these firms are headquartered or domiciled in Africa. It is our intention to secure the participation of approximately 10 to 15% of these firms. That translates to 10 to 25 SFPs contributing between 7 to $20 million in funding each. Importantly, funding only is not possible and each SFP is required to include the participation of their research and corporate venture capital operations. I have already touched on the need for research and CVC operations of multinational firms to participate in Africa. Amongst other things, this participation enables later stage funding for technologies developed on the continent and access to critical markets, which is particularly relevant in the hard tech space. I would like to take a moment to place the economics into context. Keep in mind that the GDP of South Africa is roughly equivalent to that of the state of Tennessee. Africa's GDP as a whole is roughly equal to that of France. Thus, waiving the African market as a carrot to entice the participation of international firms alone has little going for it, and there needs to be more. In fact, most SFPs know very little about any university in the region. And thus the focal point when engaging with these firms is on the use case discussed earlier. Supporting an entire region, not merely a single university, nor group of universities, nor a single country. Governments in the region are also not able to build Cirrus. For a start, governments in the region do not have the funding available, nor the expertise. Attempts at some sort of public-private partnership are also not feasible as it raises unresolved intellectual property issues and still does not address what government's contribution will be. As mentioned earlier, to the extent that government has any funding available, either now or in the future, this should be directed towards supporting existing academic and research institutions. 
On top of this, consideration must also be given to dealing with the connectivity and data management challenges and how they can be supported. To sum up the situation as one prospective SFP did, no corporation has or is going to undertake the necessary foundational work that Cirrus has. So it is Cirrus or nothing. The ongoing pressures for universities to contain costs and change the way they find themselves places emphasis on two points. One, that the current university models are not sustainable, underscores that universities themselves will not be able to bring the capabilities discussed under Cirrus into existence, but rather need to act as important stakeholders in such an effort. Two, discipline technology programs are needed to accelerate the transfer of knowledge into social and economic impacts. The partner, affiliate and co-development programs support collaboration with industry and contain the necessary provisions for technology transfer and technology sharing. This table provides a summary of the service programs and the associated technology transfer and sharing mechanisms. As Cirrus is funded and owned by industry, intellectual property originating from Cirrus is not encumbered by the Intellectual Property Rights Act in South Africa. You will note that concerning the program's digital asset lockup for universities and the Cirrus Foundry, there is reference to the IPR Act in South Africa. This reference is to instances where an invention involves a university. For example, a university invention may be brought to Cirrus for further development. Or there is the use of a university infrastructure and resources in the development of the invention. In such instances, the onus is on the university to deal with the intellectual property matters that deal with the previously mentioned challenges, possibly deploying the strategies mentioned earlier, in order that the resulting invention is attractive for commercialization. I will now cover some of the corporate structure considerations. The equity in service is owned by the strategic founding partners funding it. Employees also have a stake through an employee stock ownership program. The employee stock ownership program provides employees with skin in the game, which is by far the most effective corporate governance tool. The holding company cannot be domiciled in South Africa. Some of the factors impacting the domicile of the holding company include exchange controls, taxation, including double taxation agreements known as DTAs, disclosures, including common reporting standards, investment protection agreements, and cost. For these reasons, places like Delaware in the United States, Ireland, and Luxembourg are some of the commonly, are some of the commonly used locations. Closer to home, the nearest and likely cheapest option is Mauritius. I think it is worth mentioning that just maintaining a corporate structure domiciled in Mauritius incurs a cost running into several hundred thousand rand a year. Given the size of the Cirrus Foundry Fund with a target capitalization of $35 million, costs are a significant consideration. For the new Toyota Research Institute Fund, at $800 million, such costs would be less of a concern. Moving over to some of the Cirrus targets and constraints, a top 50 position on a top 500 list is targeted for the high performance computing platform. This would result in the HPC platform being the most powerful in Africa by large margin, as there is not a single installation from Africa on the list. To house this platform, a state-of-the-art 7,000 square foot facility will be built. This will be powered by 178,000 square feet of solar, with at least a 30% cell efficiency at the time of installation. Energy storage will consist of at least 14 megawatt hours of storage, with at least 75% efficiency. The grid will be high voltage direct current and there will be no connection to the local AC grid for the generation, storage, and HPC platform. There will also be no fossil fuel generators. The HPC platform be, will be power capped using what is generated and stored. The HPC platform will incorporate liquid cooling, likely warm water cooling. At present, only some of the compute hardware providers support liquid cooling. However, at the time of commissioning, we expect most, if not all, would have moved to support liquid cooling, which is significantly more efficient. Cirrus will have four academic programs, residency program, intern program, postdoc program, and assistantship program. And more information on these is covered in the Cirrus documentation. The Cirrus Foundry will have its own version of the intern and residency programs. The infrastructure is set to be housed at Fitz University at the locations listed on the map. Site 1 is the location for the new HPC facility, 
and the building will also house service operations. Site 2 is the location for the energy storage facility and includes solar generation. Site 3 is the location for, for additional solar generation. Site 1 is currently a parking lot and is approximately 35,000 square feet. Site 2, the energy storage facility is approximately 35,000 square feet. The solar generation on Site 2 is approximately 107,000 square feet. Site 3 has 71,000 square feet for solar generation. On the energy storage front, there are a number of viable options available, a few of which I have listed on this slide. I have included this simply as an example of some of the options, which include flow batteries, lithium ion batteries, liquid metal batteries and thermal storage. The graphic on screen is an example of an HVDC grid from NTT. Such grids have been in use for some years for renewables and HPC and are more efficient than an AC grid. Controlling all these bits and pieces is no trivial task and AR is now increasingly used to parameterize a dynamic control system. PowerStack is an example of one such effort on the power management front that is under consideration for Cirrus. On the warm water cooling front, one of the considerations is the thermosiphon cooler. The picture on screen is of a deployment at Sandia National Laboratory in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The sticker price on that is $200,000, and that does not include any taxes, which brings me to an important point. Most, like above 95% of the infrastructure value going into service, originates from suppliers that have no presence on the African continent. This is not a trivial point as it makes installation support and warranties a serious issue. For this reason, Cirrus is pursuing a strategy not that dissimilar to that deployed at the US national labs, like Sandia, which include risk sharing. Still on the cooling front, on screen is an example of a cold plate that was recently tested at Riken. Liquid flows through this plate, transferring heat from the hardware. The liquid is circulated through the HPC facility by what is called a CDU, that is a cooling distribution unit. For Cirrus, it is our intention to use a negative pressure CDU system. A negative pressure system, is an, as the name implies, operates at a negative pressure, so any resulting leak results in air being sucked into the system, as opposed to the facility being flooded with water. As you can imagine, the procurement considerations on all these pieces of infrastructure are considerable. On screen is an example from NREL on energy storage. On the HPC side, the working group procurement document, which will be used by CERS, stands at 64 pages. And this does not include electrical commissioning, which is currently under development. Making all this work, both in terms of establishing CERS and when operational, is the use of teams. Scientists work in a, in a particular domain, perhaps it is an ornithologist or material scientist or biologist. He or she is not an expert in hardware engineering, software engineering, data engineering, or a machine learning engineer. At the same time, hardware, software, data, and machine learning engineers are not ornithologists, material scientists, or biologists. However, to successfully apply machine learning AI to these fields requires people working together in teams. It sounds obvious, but to get proficient teams together to support research is a rarity. But it is something that Cirrus is built around and will provide to the research community in Africa. Just a few points before I close. One of the programs used within the Cirrus Foundry will be Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad. Many of the opportunities the Cirrus Foundry will pursue will be rather different from that which typifies most activity in the region, as the Cirrus Foundry is equipped to pursue endeavors in the hard tech space. This will be one of the tools to help hard tech startups within the Cirrus Foundry commercialize their products and services. On the Cirrus Foundry fund side, the operating manual for the fund is based on the Bloomberg Beta operating manual. The investment documents for the fund are based on those from Bloomberg Beta and Y Combinator. This includes the use of SAFES. SAFE stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. Such an agreement will be used, for example, when a startup is admitted to the Cirrus Foundry where the Cirrus Foundry Fund will invest X amount into the startup in exchange for Y amount of equity in the startup. To conclude, 
Many years of work have set up Cirrus as the opportunity to transform academic and industrial research and commercialization in Africa. Never before has such an effort spanning academia and industry been undertaken on such a scale on the continent. For academia to benefit, nothing more is required than joining the Cirrus Consortium. For government to benefit, nothing is required except continued support for local academic and research institutions that drive Cirrus utilization. This is exciting, has been the resounding response, and it is. The following are links to some of the Cirrus documents referenced in the lecture. For those interested, the Cirrus social media handles are as follows. Thanks for listening.